Welcome. Bonjour. Vous écoutez le podcast Dirty Feet sur les ondes de No More Radio. You're listening to the Dirty Feet podcast on the No More Radio Network. Nous sommes vos animateurs et animatrices. We are your hosts, Alison Burns, J.D. Papillon et Stéphanie Morin-Robert. Listen in. Écoutez. We're going to move you. This episode is being recorded in New York City. I'll be speaking with David Vaughn, who is a dance historian, an author, dancer, choreographer, actor, and singer whose work has been seen on stage and on camera. And he's worked for over 35 years as the archivist for the Merce Cunningham Company. So to start relatively close to the beginning, you moved here from England uh, in 1950. Did you expect to spend the next 65 years in New York City at that time? Oh, yes. Um, New York was where I had always wanted to be, and uh, when I had this opportunity to come here, I seized it. And um, uh, I, I remember coming up the subway steps and looking at the buildings and thinking, I'm here, I actually made it, I'm here. <laughs> And you were studying at the um, at School of American Ballet? American Ballet, yes. And this is where you met, of course, Merce Cunningham. Well, yes, because Merce was teaching a class there once a week, as I found. And so I took his class within a week of coming here. But I, I didn't get to know him at that time. I mean, it was just that one class a week. And um, after a few months, he, he left and went to away on tour and never came back to the school. And then you studied with him later and ended, ended up working. Together. Yes, well, in the middle 50s, I, I did go back to England for a year, um, ostensibly to decide where I wanted to be um, for my family's sake. And uh, But I knew perfectly well that I wanted to be here. So, And when I came back, Yes, I, I, I started studying with Merce again. And then, then I got to know him. And you were, you were working administratively by, by 1959. Yes, yes. I, I sort of became... I, I got to know him and we, I became part of his entourage, really. <laughs> and um, when he opened that first studio uh, on the corner of 14th Street and 6th Avenue, he asked me if he if I would be the studio secretary. And then how did you balance then and and throughout your career your your on stage life as a performer and well, your backstage? Yes, I, I I had started well bef even before I went to London I I started dancing in musicals in summer in a summer theater in Cleveland, Ohio. And so when I came back, I started doing sort of off-Broadway musicals and things, which I... So, and they were in the West Village, so I was able to open the studio and then have somebody else close it down while I went down and, and, and did my show. Was there ever a split of your energy where you, you would have liked to spend more time on stage or more time administrating? No, it seemed to work. Well, of course, you know, I was just the studio secretary. I, I, of course, I was the whole staff at that time. <laughs> but um, um, it, it was... I, my, I didn't have that much work to do other than <coughs> just... Um, running the studio and so on. It, only later it, it became more... It, I, I got to do more with the company and so on. And, and go, uh, sometimes go on tour as the, uh, as the um, company manager. Yeah. And I, of course, I was very much involved with all the 
with with the downtown dance scene by then too, because I, um, I, I, I even before I went to London again, I, I had um, I'd been working with James Waring, whom I met at the American School, and uh, we started a little sort of choreographers collective called Dance Associates and I did some little ballets for that and so on. So you were fed as an artist as well? Yes and also I mean when I was in that theatre in Cleveland I I started um, not only dancing in the shows but choreographing uh, numbers for them. That was actually some of the best choreography I did I think. For musicals? Yeah. And then, so, f- if we go forward 15 years, you've yeah. become the archivist. Is yeah. this something that developed out of your interest in, yes. in okay, more, yeah. than, more than the company's necessity or desire for well, archiving? Well, my interest in dance history, was, uh, was, uh, that, that was always something that I had. And so I had been keeping track of most of the programs and things that, uh, papers that um, press clippings and things that most brought back from tour and uh, I started making a chronolo- chronology of the work and things like that because I like doing things like that so and then when I went on tour with the company of course I went I collected things myself um, paper, uh, press clippings and programs and things so when Gene Rigg who was then what we would call the executive director of the company, he got a, um, a pilot grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to employ me as archivist. And that was the first time that word was used, which was formalizing what I had been doing for my own interest. And this, this also involved a lot of writing, I imagine, about the company uh, and the dances? Well, some, yes. Not not a great deal. I would sometimes, you know, write articles or things like that. Um, but I I hadn't really... I mean, I, I actually also... I was also starting to write dance reviews over and above that work because I... Um, when I... When I was in England, I used to write sometimes... I, I had a, f- a, a, f- a friend who was editor of the dance of a film magazine, and I would write articles for that. And one day, out of the blue, I got a letter from Arlene Croce saying, was I the David Vaughan whose film reviews she'd read? And she wanted to start a, a dance magazine called Ballet Review, and would I be interested in coming in with her on that? So that was something that got me writing regularly dance reviews. And then later you wrote uh, Merce Cunningham, 50 Years, and also... Well, much the- later, much, much later... Yeah because that didn't come out originally till the, ni- the 90s. But it was essentially a project or a product of the archives because uh, the editor of Aperture Mag- uh, Publishers, um, which, uh, which Aperture publishes books of photography, beautiful books, and she came to Merce and said she wanted to do a book of photographs of him and, uh, and she would need a text and of course uh, by then I was beginning to put together a book so that's how that book came about but in the meantime I'd written my book on Frederick Ashton which mm. was uh, sort of came out of my writing for Ballet Review really but uh, because I wrote an article for a uh, the Ballet Review about Ashton and it happened that a, a publisher in London wanted to publish a book about him and uh, 
the editor of the English magazine Dancing Times suggested that I might be the person who could do that book. So. Other than Merce Cunningham, is there another choreographer that you would encourage a young dance artist to inform themselves about, to become familiar with, just with your experience historically? What would you recommend if I wanted to learn about dance? Oh, well, what I did, I mean, even when, even when I was a teenager and started going, going to the ballet, I, I would read, I used to read all the books I could get my hands on about um, uh, uh, dance history and because um, there wasn't, I mean, there was no real, real profession of dance historian, even let alone archivist then. So you did a lot of reading. Yes, um, and I actually another is what I was going to say is that I used to get um, whenever possible I used to get magazines from America. And um, because I, ha I had started very late studying ballet with a, a, a teacher in London, who um, Audrey de Vos, who um, she was remarkable in many ways. Uh, it, it, apart from the fact that she took me on as a student, was remarkable because I, I it was late and I was I was very weak physically at that time but she um, uh, not only did she teach ballet in a rather unorthodox way but also she taught a form of modern dance that she made up because there was no modern dance in England really to speak of then um, so I and that's how I, I, I knew about Merce before I came here here. And when I found that Merce was teaching at the American school, that was, you know, wonderful for me. I thought, oh, well, I'm going to teach with this, you know, important choreographer. With the Merce Cunningham Company, what element or philosophy do you hope holds over for years and years to come? What's the most important essence of the company that should be... Well, Preserved. I think one of the most important things, really, as it now develops, is the, is the fact that the technique continues to be taught and should be, continue to be taught because it is a technique for dancing. It's not just to, um, to, uh, to teach a Cunningham style or something. You learn just to dance in a Cunningham class and um, it's funny because you know one of the most obvious elements of Mercy's dance dances is is the fact that the dance and music are independent of one another and that really doesn't seem to have taken not many other choreographers have taken that on. Mm. Not as a philosophy, the way Merce did. Um, I mean, a choreographer like Richard Alston in London, who really is very influenced by Merce in his dancing style, doesn't... He wants to dance to music. So... Uh, in that way he does not follow Merz and I think that may be something that goes on but I think also it is important that Merz's work as well as the technique that, that some of the dances at least should be continued to be, be, be performed by other companies and that's happening I mean all over not only here in America but in um, in London and in, in, um, in all over Europe as well. Merce Cunningham was a very influential choreographer, and there are several over the history of of dance, and and those influences bleed into next generation of choreographers, as you were talking about. Maybe the 
the music dance disconnect was not one of those elements that is carried on, but a lot of physicality is carried on. Mm, I think so. I, I mean, I don't. I doubt if if many other choreographers use the chance processes that Merz mm. made a big element in his in his work. Um, in the in the context of the work, kind of bleeding into the next generation, what is the importance of of maintaining an archive of of the original influential choreographer's work. Uh, Mercy's work, for example. For example, well, I mean, yeah. well, for example, oh, I mean, my archives. Um, uh, when the company was uh, discontinued, um, the archives went to the New York Public Library, and that's where they are, and that, uh, which is a very important uh, resource for people. I mean, the library itself, you know, because that's the place to go to if you want to study dance history in general or, or the history of individual choreographers as well. So my archives are now there, um, have been catalogued and, um, in the terms of the library situation. So that, that makes me feel very good. I mean... The, that the work didn't just you know, got thrown away or something. Of course. It's made available for the next generation yes, of is. artists. Yes, it is indeed. When you see work these days, um, which I imagine you still do. Uh, not as much not as, as much. I used to. Or even before then, is it inescapable that you put a historical context on what you're seeing, that you see influences and, and kind of process the origins of the work while you're watching it? I don't think I watch it that analytically when I watch dancing. No, I certainly, I, mean, I certainly look for a choreographer who has a personal, an original voice, if you can use that word, rather than really trying to pin down influences. That, you know, I, I think, as I've often said, I, I believe in the, in the possibility of dance renewing itself, which it does through the emergence of new choreographers who who have something new to say, and there are such choreographers who who do show an influence of, of Merz, like Pam Tanowitz is very strongly influenced by Merz's choreography, but she has her own individual voice, and that's that's how it should be. I think that's how it con it, the, it continues. Hmm. Is New York City still? the same place it was? For me in 1950. Uh, well, in many ways, I mean, I'm still living in, in this... I, I first lived in this building in 1951. Not in this apartment, when I, but when I moved in with a friend who was a dancer in New York City Ballet, whom I knew through the school. And she had this apartment on the on the ground floor, and uh, I moved in with her. That lasted for a couple of years only, because um, I mean it worked out very well. We didn't, as she used to say, we didn't get in each other's hair. And uh, but then she hooked up with Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> And he moved in, and obviously the apartment was not big enough for th three people. It's the same. It's the ground floor apartment, which is the same as this, but maybe not quite as spacious because of the stairs. But um, so, and then several many years later, when I I was on tour with the company on the world tour in 1964. And Ruth cabled me in India and said, there's an apartment avail available on the third floor, do you want it? 
so I moved back into this building then which I, is great for me I love this neighborhood which of course has gone through many changes in the years I've lived here Yes, we're here in the in the East Village yes. in Manhattan. Yes. In Manhattan. Yes, yes. And are you still just as inspired by what's happening in dance as you were when you were excited to leave England in the fifties? Yes, in, in in perhaps different ways. I mean, I still continue to be very interested in what's happening in ballet, but then. Yeah. Something I learned from Audrey de Vos was not to think of dance being sort of in separate niches or whatever the word is. In other words, it's all dancing for me. And, and it, that, and it, to ignore the genres a little bit? What? To ignore the genres, the styles, and just see it as dance? Well, I don't ignore them, and I, I don't necessarily feel of them as uh, think of them as being separate from one another there to me it's all dancing and I think I've always thought that whether it was ballet or what modern dance I could see or or even you know Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers on in the movies I, mm-hmm. I, I still think that's some of the craziest dancing I've ever seen or musicals, for that matter? Well, musicals in general, I mean, I, as, I, as I told you, I did a lot of them, both in summer stock and off-Broadway, and even on, on Broadway, I was in a terrible, failed musical. But it, it was all part of my involvement with dancing, which has been the most important thing in my life, really. What questions should I ask you next? I don't know. I think I've... Well... Well... Of course... It's very surprising to me... At my advanced age... To find myself... Having... Performed again... With... With Peppa... In... In... in Montreal... I think that's extraordinary and uh, <laughs> and it was very exciting for me to do that This was of course a co-venture at the Montreal Fringe Festival yeah. from the Brooklyn Touring Outfit And we were supposed to do it again in January Yes, with the Wildside Festival at Centaur Theatre it called? The Wildside Wild Side. In the Centaur Theatre That's you, correct And you know that theatre? Yes, I, I used to work there and I presented work at the Wild Side last oh. year. Oh, okay. Yeah. But Montreal in January is going to be... Chilly. Chilly, to say the least, yes. <laughs> I see. But I heard you you were uh, you performed just last week as well. Uh, well, I do. You know, I sing from time to time when I, when I have the opportunity. I, not very much in, in, in public. Well, at... I in my uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, last year on my ninetieth birthday, uh, they gave a party for me at the library, and I did a little so called cabaret with uh, uh, someone who was who had been a dancer in the Coming and Company. Daniel Roberts played for me, and I sang a number of songs and. Uh, so that was I do something like that sometimes like I sang at uh, one of Pepper's evenings at his studio but uh, it's not something I, I would think of doing it for a large public anywhere any last <laughs> thoughts well, I no, I think I've, I'm a very lucky person that I've been able, in spite of some obstacles at the beginning, I've been able to do what I most wanted to do in my life, which uh, I think is something that not everybody gets to do. Mm-hmm. 
I'm, I'm very excited about the duality that you've lived with, with performing and also your, your love of dance manifesting in a different way. Yeah. Yes, well, it has. I mean, it's, been, it's wonderful to be able to, as you say, that, 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 that my love of dancing does manifest itself in all those different ways. Mm-hmm. And and the respect for that supportive role that you played in that, and and your heart being so in that company that you created that position that, you know, allowed allowed served the Merce Cunningham Company very well, yeah. and the next generation of artists. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you so much for for talking with me today. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. The Dirty Feet Podcast is produced and hosted by Produit et animé par Alison Burns J.D. Papillon et Stéphanie Morin-Robert We have Mainline Theater, Montreal Improv Theater and Paula Flalo to thank. Merci pour le soutien. Vous pouvez visiter notre site web, écouter les derniers épisodes, lire notre blog, nous aimer sur Facebook et nous suivre sur Twitter. You can visit our website, listen to past episodes, read our blog, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Show us some love and help us spread the word. Montrez-nous un peu d'amour et aidez-nous à passer le mot.